Please be seated. Good afternoon, and welcome to this remembrance and celebration of the life and person of Heather Aaliyah. On behalf of the family, first let me say thank you for being here. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your words of comfort. Thank you for your support over the past few days that it has been very appreciated. We're here this afternoon to celebrate and to give thanks for Heather, but also we are joined together by a common grief. And this time of grief and mourning can be an uncertain time, uncertain in terms of its longevity, but also uncertain in how people react because of the grief. C.S. Lewis observed that after the death of his wife, he was resentful of people who came up to him and asked him how he was, often wanting to be alone with his thoughts and not knowing how to answer the question. But he also felt just as resentful when people didn't ask him how he was, thinking that they were uncaring. Grief is hard. Grief is confusing. Grief is intense, intense. And I think it's because grief is often the costly consequence of love. The risk of love is loss, and the price of loss is grief. So today, today we feel grief. We grieve because we feel the pain of loss, and that loss is significant because of the strength of our love for Heather. That love continues. The grief doesn't diminish it, because often in the early days, weeks, months after a loss, we feel that love even stronger than we did before. So what brings us here today is not just grief, but also a deep, strong love of Heather. We come together to give thanks for her life. We come together to give thanks for the way that her life touched ours. We come together to remember the hope that comes from entrusting Heather into God's keeping. Jesus said this, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. With those words in mind, let's lean into this hope. Let's lean into God. Let's lean into Jesus. Let's pray. God, we turn to you, and we seek your grace, and we acknowledge we need your help as we look for hope. I, I love that you are a God who is willing and eager, a God who is able to walk with us through difficult times. I love that you are a God who is willing and eager to guide and grant us incredible peace. I love that you are a God who is willing and eager to cover us with comfort and assurance from your presence. So Jesus, please, in your love and your mercy, Allow us to feel your compassion and sense the hope and peace that comes when you draw near to us. May that become very real even in this service as we lean into you and wait for your comfort, your strength, and your peace. In your name we pray. Amen. Invite everyone except the family to stand if you would please. If you know the songs, join me this afternoon. All these pieces broken and scattered In mercy gathered, mended and whole Empty-handed but not forsaken I've been set free I've been set free Amazing grace 
How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Oh, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. I can see you now. I can see the love in your eyes. You're laying yourself down, raising up the broken to life. You take our failures, you take our weakness, you set your treasure in jars of clay. Please take this heart, Lord. I'll be your vessel, the world to see your life in me. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Oh, I once was lost. But now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Oh, I can see you now. I can see the love in your eyes, laying yourself down. up the broken to life. You can have a seat. Scripture reading for this afternoon comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 10 to 12, and then verses 16 through to 18. Here's what it says. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. Therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix on eyes, fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is unseen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carrie McDonald, and I'm a longtime friend of the Green family. Kaylee called me the other night to ask if I would consider delivering Heather's eulogy for all of you here today. And although I wish it wasn't something that had to be done, I was honored and graciously accepted the offer. This is, without a doubt, the most important story I have delivered thus far in my life. I met Kaylee and Heather back when we were one, two, and three years old. The story goes, my mom had me at the park and Alan came at the same time with Kaylee. They got to talking and realized we were similar in age and had similar spelling of our names, K-A-L-I and K-A-R-I, and the rest is history. We grew up in the same neighborhood in Stratford, and, I, and when I tell you I don't have many childhood memories that don't include those two, I mean it. Our childhoods were intertwined with one another. I was practically the Greens' fourth child. 
dance classes, piano, singing recitals, trick-or-treating, playing at the park, riding bikes, sleepovers galore. You get the picture. Wherever those two girls were, I was there, right in the middle. We were all almost exactly a year apart, so for me that worked out great. I played with both of them together. If one wasn't available, I found myself with the other. We had so much fun together, and when Adam came along, well, he was a real life doll for us all. <laughs> I'm sure we tried to be helpful, but maybe in turn we caused some unease. If that were the case, Lynn and Alan never let it be known. I always felt wanted and welcome in their home and on their adventures, and for that, I want to thank you both. Thank you for allowing us to have a childhood filled with happy, lifelong memories. When I sat down to gather my thoughts on how I wanted to go about delivering this eulogy, I found I was all over the place. I was flooded with memories and emotions, stories from Heather's friends, family, coworkers, and I wasn't sure how my words would ever do Heather's beautiful life and existence on this earth justice. So I decided that I was going to write what felt right. I wasn't going to stress about structure, wording, or perfection. I was going to try my very best to find the words that would speak to the hearts of everyone here today. I felt it appropriate to start off with a little story of my own about a time with Heather. One that should not have occurred. <laughs> but after about 20 years, I think it's safe to laugh about now. Heather had curly hair, tight, ringlet curls, especially when she was younger. One day, Kaylee and I were straightening her curly hair. Now, I wish I could say we were six, seven, eight years old, but given the fact that we had access to a straightener and knew what to do with it, I think it's safe to say we were probably in grades five, six, and seven. So we proceeded to straighten her hair, and I will forever remember Kaylee looking at her ends and saying, oh my gosh, Heather, your ends are so fried. And me, <laughs> me agreeing, oh yeah, they really are. Heather saying, oh really? And us suggesting we trim it. Heather agreed and we got to work. It wasn't shortly after we started that we realized this wasn't going well. It was so uneven and it was just getting shorter and shorter. Now, instead of me suggesting we stop what we were doing and going to get help, I had a different idea. I drafted up a contract. I, Heather Green, allow my sister, Kaylee Green, and Carrie Blanchard to cut my hair and I will not get them in trouble. <laughs> we all signed it and continued cutting. <laughs> Not long after, Lynn opened the bathroom door and caught us, scissors in hand. She was not happy. In the silence of that moment, I slid her the contract, and I said, I think I'm going to go home now. To which she replied, oh, no, you don't. Honestly, I don't even remember what was said after that. If there was punishments involved, tears shed, I don't remember. Maybe that happened after I left. But I do remember the next day, Heather getting on the bus and realizing just how short it actually was. Because, like I said, we had straightened it when we cut it. So when she wet it and it was curly again, it was right up to there. Now, I will follow up with this. Heather did rock a shoulder length haircut later on in her life and it looked absolutely fabulous. So maybe really, that cut really inspired her. <laughs> Every one of you here today has been touched by Heather over her short but fulfilling life. Over the last couple of days, I have reached out to various people who have been in Heather's life for different reasons. I wanted to see what other people saw in her through a different lens, whether it was a lifelong friend, a coworker, family, or mom friends. Every single one of them touched on the same qualities. She was angelic, an angel on earth, happy, kind, easy to talk to, supportive, silly, funny, artistic, intelligent, and most importantly, a beautiful mother to her two children, Nicole and Paul, and a supportive wife to Harrison. As I had mentioned previously, Heather lived in Stratford during her early years, and it was at this time she became involved in a variety of extracurricular activities. Piano, soccer, swimming, painting, to name a few. She even went on to complete, complete a triathlon in a Tough Mudder. Heather was a talented, self-taught artist. If you look around here today, you will see some different photos of her paintings. The original pieces are at home with her family. I would encourage you to look at these. They are truly magnificent. A close friend of the family wrote this about Heather. When the older girls were off doing their thing, I would have a craft ready to do with Heather. This was when Lynn and I would, Lynn would say, Heather and I were kindred spirits. This special place in my heart for Heather never wavered. My memories of time spent creating with her will always be special to me. When Heather was 13, she and her family moved to Comox Valley on Vancouver Island. A big move with lots of tears shed, especially by me. 
It was during this time she met Harrison. They originally met in junior high. Heather was in the eighth grade and Harrison in the ninth. They shared mutual friends, were both in band together and involved in drama productions put on at their school. Both Heather and Harrison were lifeguards and it is at that time that their relationship started to develop more. And then while Heather was in university, they officially started dating. Heather and Harrison loved to do outdoor activities together and would often go hiking. It was during a very minor six hour hike to Cape Scott that Harrison would propose to Heather. Oh, they, <laughs> I was getting there. So it was a six hour hike, they did it in four, and Harrison later described this as a quick hike because he was so eager to get to the beach at the end of it so he could propose to Heather. They then proceeded to camp for two nights away from Wi-Fi so no one knew that they were engaged yet. So I can only imagine how special those two days were. Now, this is where things get interesting. I always knew Heather was smart, but I did not realize how truly intelligent this girl was. Heather attended Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. She completed her undergraduate degree in kinesiology, but that's not all she did. Heather was a member on a self-directed team project. She and her teammates developed a training protocol that studied the difference in lifting techniques once fatigued between males and females. They were invited to Boston to present this project and their work was later published. This protocol went on to become the standard protocol for Queen's University varsity athletes and continues to be in use today. Heather also volunteered with the Winter Adaptive Games, which supports individuals with identified disabilities to partake in non-competitive games and activities. Heather thoroughly enjoyed her time involved with this program. While at Queen's, Heather found her faith and her community. She developed friendships, relationships, and a true love for the Lord. This time was instrumental in ensuring that she could find her community wherever she was living moving forward. Once Heather was set to complete her kinesiology degree, she began applying to her Master's of Physiotherapy, having known that becoming a physiotherapist was her end goal. She applied to a few schools, two of which being the University of British Columbia and Queen's University. Now I need to explain that UBC sends out their letters of offer before Queen's. So she was offered a seat at UBC, which she accepted, and at the end of the school year, she gave up her apartment, sold all of her things, and was packed up and ready to go back to BC for the summer and attend UBC that fall. While she was literally on the way to the airport, she received a phone call from the Dean at Queens. The Dean informed her that four professors presented themselves to him and said, we need this girl to do her Master's of Physiotherapy here. She's going to UBC, but we want her here. The Dean then offered her a seat, along with a full scholarship while she was on her way to the airport to go to a different school. So she asked him, uh, can I think about this? So he gave her four hours. <laughs> Heather called Alan and said, Dad, I think I have a problem. She proceeded to explain the explanation she had, she, the conversation she had just had. And the advice given to her from both Alan and Lynn was, you have no problem here, say yes. And that is what she did. She spent the summer in BC, returned to Queens in the fall, found a new apartment, and started her Master's of Physiotherapy and excelled every step of the way. While Heather was completing her Master's of Physiotherapy, there was a, clinic, a final clinical placement that she needed to complete prior to graduation. Heather knew she wanted to do her physio placement on Prince Edward Island, but she needed special permission to do so. So in 2015, at 23 years old, she was granted permission to complete her placement and came here for 10 weeks. During this time, she reestablished connections and friendships that stood the test of time and distance. She stayed with her auntie Nancy and uncle Brad and her two cousins, Emily and Rebecca. This time, was, this, time for Heather, this time was special for Heather and her family, especially with her cousins. They felt they each gained another sister. Her placement solidified that she did indeed want to make her way back to PEI one day. Following her graduation, she returned to BC where she and Harrison worked for a couple of years in the Okanagan before their wedding in 2017. Some of Heather's bridesmaids are here today. And Heather and Harrison later made Hazelbrook their home. Heather started working at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital and quickly became a vital part of their team there. I reached out to some of her coworkers to hear what they had to say about Heather and they all had a similar experience. She was joyful. She never complained even on the toughest of days. She celebrated her patients, she encouraged them even when they weren't too eager to see her. She would go in with a positive energy and motivation because she wanted them to get better. She told her patients what she expected of them and she supported them to ensure they got there. She was happy, but stern. She also supported her coworkers outside of work, one time showing up to watch a coworker's band concert alone. The, that coworker was shocked to see her there and then was filled with gratitude. Heather went on to say she saw the poster on the unit, loved music and wanted to hear some Christmas songs. Heather showed up. 
She came to everything she was invited to. As I had previously mentioned, Heather found her faith while she was at Queens, and when she moved to PEI, she knew she wanted to celebrate her faith and join a community here. This is when she found Cornerstone Baptist Church, where we are today, led by Pastor Phil. Cornerstone not only provided Heather with an opportunity to grow in her faith, but to create lifelong relationships and friendships with many members here. These members, now friends, supported one another in their faith, as well as their journeys through life and into motherhood. Heather always knew she wanted to be a mother. She and Harrison started their family soon after they were married. In March of 2020, Heather and Harrison welcomed their first daughter, to, their first child together, a baby girl named Nicole. Now, March 2020, that was a challenging time for everyone, especially new parents. And Heather and Harrison did what they could to ensure they kept their new baby safe, and Heather fell into the role of mother and protector, naturally. Heather was gentle, patient, and loving. She was a confident mother and didn't, and becoming a mother didn't hold her back. She simply brought Nicole along for their adventures. Heather made it a conscious effort to be present and ensure she was instilling the gift of music, activity, reading, and art into Nicole's early life, much like her parents did for her. It was at this time that Heather created new relationships, mom friends. They were such an important part of a mother's journey, especially the first time around when everything is new. Some of her mom friends told me that the early days of motherhood in 2020 were challenging, but Heather was someone who could brighten their days. Even if they hadn't slept the night before or were concerned about their child's development, Heather was always a listening ear and a source of reassurance for them. Heather was the one to organize gatherings never and never came empty-handed, often bringing along a dish, delicious baked good and organizing crafts, crafts for them to do with their babies. She had the ability to turn their challenging days around, and they said they always left feeling better. Two years later, she and Harrison welcomed Paul in March of 2022. Transitioning from one to two children seemed effortless. Heather and Paul quickly connected, and Nicole fell into the role of big sister to her baby Paul. On the last day of March 2023, Heather received a life-shattering diagnosis. In receiving this, it realigned her reality and her priorities, and she handled it with grace. Shortly after her diagnosis, Heather made the decision to be baptized here at Cornerstone to reaffirm her faith on her own terms, surrounded by the community she had grown to love. You meant so much to her, and for that, you mean everything to us. Experiencing and living life in whatever capacity she could became her priority. Gone were the days of, yeah, maybe someday. It became, let's go. Since her diagnosis, she traveled to Fundy, made pottery, enjoyed a folk festival. She went sailing, she painted, and she spent time with the ones she loved. Heather was one of 12 chosen to go see an East Pointer single review. And even though she had just been discharged from the hospital, she said, I am not missing this. She was so, and she, she was also very excited when Tim Chasen, the lead singer, said, oh, hi, to her, and she giggled to Alan, oh, he remembers me. <laughs> well, Heather, that he does. I was able to get in touch with him through a mutual friend, and this is what he had to say to you. I am so grateful to have met Heather at the East Pointers, at a few East Pointers events. To witness her love for music and to see her face light up as we played, it is literally why we do what we do. I am so sor sorry to hear of Heather's passing. My heart goes out to her friends and family at this time. Tim, Heather, you are unforgettable. Heather made lasting impressions on those around her and made a lifetime of memories during the period of time she had left with us. One thing that her entire family took note of was Heather learned to ask for help. This didn't come naturally, as she was always the one doing the caretaking and never wanted to be a bother. But she advocated for herself and she leaned on those around her for support. And in doing so, she realized her family wanted to help. She learned to accept that she was not a burden and it was an honor to be able to support her in achieving her goals and creating memories. Heather was a dedicated mother an old soul and nurturing since the beginning of her life. Quality time with her children was her priority. They were her everything. She would plan her naps and rest around when the kids would be coming over so that she was able to give them 100% of herself. She poured every ounce of energy she had into that time with her kids. As her illness progressed and it was evident that her time was getting shorter and shorter, her children were her medicine. They got the best of Heather, always. During the last days of Heather's life, she was surrounded by her family. She was able to make all of her healthcare decisions and collaborated with colleagues and friends in a way she never had before. Those colleagues and friends supported her and her family to the end of her life. 
Heather leaves a legacy for us all through her stories, experiences, and her artwork. And that legacy will continue through to her children because of all of you here today who will share her story and support Harrison, Nicole, and Paul as they navigate life without their wife and mother. She has motivated many to see what truly matters in life. I would like to finish up by saying, life rarely goes as planned and it doesn't always make sense. But I will say watching your families set aside differences and distances to come together to support Heather in her time of need has been nothing short of amazing. Heather, thank you for being you and for allowing me to share a small piece of your story. I wanted to finish off in Heather's last words. I love you so much and you're the best. Thank you. Thank you so much. Would you stand again and we'll sing together. There's a peace. There's a peace I've come to know. Though my heart and flesh may fail, there's an anchor for my soul. I can say it is well. Jesus has overcome, and the grave is overwhelmed. The victory is won. He is risen from the dead. And I will rise when he calls my name. No more sorrow, no more pain. I will rise on eagle's wings. For my God, fall on my knees and rise. I will rise. There's a day that's drawing near when this darkness breaks to light. And all the shadows disappear And my faith shall be my eyes Jesus has overcome And the grave is overwhelmed The victory is one and he is risen from the dead and i will rise when he calls my name no more sorrow there'll be no more pain i will rise on eagle's wings for my God, fall on my knees, and I'll rise, I will rise. I hear the voice of many angels sing, worthy is the I hear the cry of every longing heart. Worthy is the Lamb. I hear the voice of many angels sing. Worthy is the Lamb. I hear the cry of every longing heart worthy is the land and i will rise when you call my name no more sorrow no more pain 
I will rise on eagles' wings before my God, fall on my knees and rise. I will rise. Can I have a seat? It was the fall of 2019 when Heather first entered our lives here at this particular community of faith. She attended one of our IF conferences that fall with some of the women who already attended here, and it didn't take her long out of that conference to form and forge what would become some lifelong friends in a very short period of time. I first met Heather in a very personal way, my wife and I, during COVID-19. They were expecting Nicole, and my wife loves to bless people, individual families, as they're entering into parenthood, and they try, Amy tries to throw a wonderful baby shower for them, but we weren't allowed to do things with people in early COVID. So she said, well, let's do a drive-by baby shower. And I was like, what does that look like? And she's like, well, we'll see if they'll come and stand outside, and people will bring them treasures from all corners of the earth. And so that's what they did. They stood outside the carport, Harrison and Heather, and people drove and they dropped stuff off out the window. And I'm like, this is the greatest invention ever. Baby showers are, you have to do them, but it's like an hour and a half, two hours of games and stuff. And, and this was like, where was this for years? So they got all kinds of stuff. It took 15 minutes and we were, able to, we were able to bless them in significant ways. Uh, but that's when I really first had my encounter with them. Heather continued to bless many inside our church family, and I know that she was deeply blessed by them all. Late March, early April of 2023, the world stood still where we were all processing the information, how is it possible for someone who's this young to be diagnosed with cancer? I remember being invited to their home and sitting with them at their kitchen table. Tears, questions filled the room. What am I, I got in my car a few moments after. Tears and questions filled my car. A few days later, Heather reached out, expressed her desire to be baptized. That morning was a powerful morning for me. We baptized her kind of right over here. And it was interesting on the heels of the conversation that I had just had with them. Here is a young woman who is all in on trusting Jesus with her life, knowing full well that her life may come to an end much sooner than she ever possibly would have dreamed. So tonight, today, I want to share with you what I shared with them at that visit, sitting at their kitchen table, following the news of the cancer diagnosis. The questions that were present at that table, I suspect, are some of the same questions that you have thought and have worked through, and maybe you're sitting in those right now. How is it possible? If God is, in fact, loving, where is he in all of this? How is this loving? How is this fair? And the list of questions can go on. Please hear me when I say this. Death isn't fair. Death doesn't care. Death has one goal for your life, one goal for my life, and it is to rob us. It is to ruin us. It is to destroy us in all kinds of ways. And yet, we sit in the conversation of death believing that it's just a normal part of life. And yet, everyone in this room understands that there's nothing natural or normal about this moment. There's nothing normal or natural for a mother and a father to bury their daughter. There's nothing normal for a husband after a few short years to lose his wife. There's nothing normal about children growing up without a mom. As I sat with Heather and Harrison that night around their table, I'll say to you this afternoon, death isn't normal. Death isn't natural. Death is something that was never supposed to be here. And the reason why I can say this is that we put a lot of stock in who Jesus Christ is. And Jesus tells us that death, this thing that has brought us all together this afternoon, is linked to something that he calls the wages of sin. You can read this passage in the book of Romans chapter 6. It's why we're gathered here, because death is an outworking of what Jesus calls sin. And this sin, or the other name that Jesus gives to it, which probably properly defines our feelings right now, the curse that ultimately took Heather's life, 
was far beyond Heather's control. And it's beyond mine, it's beyond yours. I'm not talking about cancer. I'm not talking about sickness. I'm not talking about natural causes. These are simply manifestations or symptoms of the curse or sin at work in the world. Jesus unpacks this well in his word to us. He takes us back to the very beginning of time when he created Adam and Eve and placed them in the Garden of Eden. There, God intended for Adam and Eve to live with God, with each other, and in this world perfectly and forever, where they would experience life, life to its full in all of its forms and expressions. In the garden, at the beginning of time, death, the curse, these are not part of the equation in any way, shape, or form. God there in the garden speaks to his sons and daughters, Adam and Eve, and he gives them a choice. He says, you can do this my way, and you can live and flourish and enjoy all that I've made for you, or you can do this your way. And if you do this your way, something foreign will enter the world, something that you know nothing of, something that will ruin and rob you for all of your days. History tells us that Adam and Eve chose to do things their own way. And from this moment on, the world has never been the same. The moment that they chose to run their own lives, that is the very moment they are separated from God. A curse falls over the entire created world. Sin and death enter into God's good and beautiful creation. Please understand that sin and death, the curse, these are not natural and these were never part of God's intention. Sin and death were never intended by God to be a part of his world. The curse is something that entered in and is continually unavoidable in our lives. It began with Adam and Eve, and it has passed down through the years, over the generations, one to the next, and it is why we're gathered here this afternoon. Heather, Heather Patricia, when she was diagnosed with cancer, we were witnesses of this curse being played out in her life, and we are all witnesses to this curse, this consequence of sin, as we watch our loved ones die, and it will claim many more along the way, including ourselves. Romans 5 clearly defines what Jesus is talking about where he says, sin, curse entered the world through one man, one person, and death through sin. And because of this, death will come to all people. Death is very real. It is coming. But death was never part of God's original plan. It is not natural. It is not supposed to happen. It is why on the heels of death, we struggle to figure out what life looks like because something entered it that was never supposed to be there to begin with. Heather knew this. This is what we talked about that night at our kitchen table, and it caused her to lean in and love Jesus all the more. Because as we keep reading through the book of Romans, we run into other words of Jesus where he talks about a gift of God, which is eternal life, that comes through a relationship with Jesus himself. And for those of us that knew Heather well, Heather loved Jesus deeply. Heather knew Christ personally. Heather had a deep faith in Christ, and listening to her life, it sounds like it shaped much of who she was. This past Easter, days after her diagnosis, days after the kitchen table conversation, it was a moment that I'll never forget, taking her back into the water during her baptism, her telling her story of her love for Jesus, trusting him with her whole life, trusting him, right into what is now her death. And now, while we are here processing all of this, she, Heather, because of the role Christ was in her life, she is completely fine. What some of us don't know, or we have forgotten, God never gave up on his world. Even after sin and death entered it, God, out of love for his world, worked out a way to redeem it through his son, Jesus Christ, the one in whom Heather knew and loved deeply. God, through his son, created a way back into a relationship with him. Every Easter, this is why we gather and celebrate. Christ lived on this earth as a man. He lived some 33 years. He dealt with the same issues we do. He walked through the shadow of death with close friends and family. Christ experienced the full extent of the curse by going to the grave himself. But because of who he was and who he is, through his perfect life, God, his father, raised him from the dead defeating the power of sin, this curse that's at work in the world. And even though the curse will come for all of us as it has for Heather, Heather had a relationship with Jesus Christ, which means she is present with Christ. And one day, at his return, she will be raised. And knowing Heather, she would want me to say to you, you too can have this same relationship that she had with him. 
Christ loves you as he loved Heather. And Christ says to you, if you want to live, truly live, both now and in the life to come, if you want to experience what I intended from you from the beginning, if you want to live in such a way that fear has no hold over you and death has no hold over you, it comes in knowing and walking with him, Jesus Christ. I want to close with a passage of scripture that Mike read a few moments ago, and I've kind of rewritten it a little bit with Heather in mind, with her name woven in, and hopefully you can see how this will fit together in what I'm talking about. This is from 2 Corinthians, adding Heather's name in. We, Heather, always carried around in her body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in her body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that in Heather's life, his life may also be revealed in her mortal body. So death is at work in us, but life was at work in her. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Heather did not lose heart. Though outwardly our bodies waste away, Heather's body wastes away, yet inwardly she knew she was being renewed day by day, for this light and momentary trouble is achieving something for her that far outweighs it all. Heather was an incredible young woman. She loved the Lord deeply, and it saved her life in every sense of that word. Would you pray with me? Our gracious and heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the gift of Heather. We are so grateful for how she has blessed all of us in this room and many more who are not here. We are grateful for the stories that have been told. We pray that through the tears that we shed that we would sense your spirit ministering to us. And as we go our separate ways here in a few moments, it's my prayer that Heather's life in you would just continue to have an echoing effect in our own. That we might see Christ in her. And that would carry over into our lives and shape us in some profound ways. May you speak to us, shape us, heal us. In your name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand if you would, please. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace, twas grace that taught my heart to fear. And grace my fears relieve How precious did that grace appear The hour I first believed My chains are gone I've been set free My God, my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing has promised himself to me his word my hope secures he will my shield and portion be as long as life endures my chains are gone I've been set free my God, my Savior, 
has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing grace would you pray with me our gracious and heavenly father you meet us in spaces of loss. You meet us in spaces of mourning. And the kind of healing that you bring is nothing, nothing compares to this. All the ways in which we try to find solace, all the ways we try to seek comfort, all the ways we try to put things back together again, none of those things can offer what you offer. And God, I pray that the family, Harrison, all of them, walk in this deep knowledge and this deep awareness that you are very present in their life, helping them stitch things back together again. We ask these things in your name. Amen.